afternoon. We have participants uh, from India, Singapore, uh, I see Hong Kong, China, uh, Taiwan, Indonesia, Korea, and Japan. Welcome to our DBS webinar brought to you by Treasury and Markets. My name is Ken Fu. I will be your host and moderator for this session. The theme for today is China and Asia after COVID, the prospects and opportunities. We will have a discussion on the impact of COVID-19 on China's economy, the supply chain, as well as potential prospects and opportunities for investment. No thanks to COVID, but many of us have become used to being just a video box on someone else's screen, not like the bready bunch for those who are old enough to, to know them. Only that we are just more modern looking and, and having fewer pastel colors, if you know what I mean. So in order to make this webinar interactive, participants can type in your questions in the Q&A box, uh, which you can find as a function on WebEx. We will attend to your questions during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. For those who, have, who are joining us by phone only, please send your questions by email and we will come back to you as soon as possible. We have two speakers today, Nathan Chow and uh, Ma Te Ying. Nathan is our senior economist based in Hong Kong. He is responsible for the monitoring of market developments, the offshore renminbi business, as well as macroeconomic conditions in Greater China. He is a frequent and popular face in front of clients across Asia, conducting talks and seminars in the region. Before we begin, let me remind you that we will be sending out slides uh, to our participants after this seminar. So if you think you have missed something on the slide, don't worry. In fact, our sales representatives who are also on this call will be able to help, help you afterwards. Uh, but first and foremost, let me invite our Managing Director, uh, Teo Sichong, affectionately known to us as TC, to say a few words. TC? Hi, everyone. Good afternoon and welcome to DBS webinar. My name is TC. Thanks, Ken, for the introduction. Um, first of all, I want to thank everyone for dialing in. It's, uh, it's a very difficult situation now, as, as all of us are working in different offices in different parts of the world. I would like to thank you for joining us this afternoon to listen to Nathan and Tien on the view of the market. In the last few weeks, the new experience in working from home in separate sites is an unintended consequence of the virus testing the global communication and technology platform, as well as um, the future of work. And this potentially could start a new trend and new thinking as to how we behave socially and how we behave in the workplace. Since the start of COVID-19, different country has been uh, facing varying degree of uh, faction in terms of trajectory, in terms of uh, dealing with the problem, in terms of, of, of meeting the challenges of the economic slowdown and supporting SME and individual. Some country like China, Korea, Taiwan seems to have been more successful in curbing the spread of the infection and is recovering. Others like Singapore and Japan continue to see new classes of infection. While well, the government are trying very hard uh, to flatten the curve, as you can see, um, Singapore, we have extended an additional 14 days. It has hit the economy gravely in different parts of the world, it has disrupted the supply chain, and it has caused financial market to be in the turmoil. And we have seen various incidents in the recent weeks and months that we have not encountered before. The extreme volatility in the equity market and US Treasury, and the stoppages in the um, high yield market, and 
more recently, WTI and the West Canadian Select settled at negative. Now these are these are un unprecedented uh, situation that we have met, and unless the virus is eradicated or medication developed to give some therapeutic treatment and confidence, and potentially a vaccine in the near future, this virus can come back and haunt us on a seasonal fashion. So with this in mind, it is, um, it is important to ponder over two questions that we want answer to. Firstly, what are the prospect and opportunity we can capture in this, in, in, in this market condition, in this condition without an end game? Nathan, our senior economist, will share our insights. Secondly, what is the impact of the regional and global supply chain? Our economist, Matthew Yin, shall describe to us how supply chain has been disrupted, with demand and supply uh, disruption, and disruption to inventory and financing, and how we might see a recasting of supply chain management as company adjust to the new world norm. Before I hand over to Ken again, I would like to wish you and family and friends best of health and stay safe. Ken? Mine is not up. Oops. Sorry. Thank you, TC. Uh, Nathan, it's your turn to shine. Uh, so please go ahead with the presentation. All right. Thank, uh, thank you, TC and Ken. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. So uh, just like what TC has just mentioned, uh, it is now clear that the COVID-19 has presented the global economy with an unprecedented challenge. Um, what started as a supply shock has turned into a demand shock. And uh, the whole thing has a very weak starting point, like a maturing global cycle, rising protectionism, stock market prices were already very expensive and soaring uh, leverages, not to mention the oil shock, right? So all of this, a combination of this has led to extreme volatility that we have been seeing over the past two months. Uh, but fortunately, despite all of the doom and gloom, we are right now at least seeing some positive developments. And most importantly, China, the first part of the world that, uh, where effect, that is affected by the crisis is right now leading the way out of it. Uh, but of course, there is still a lot of challenges ahead. And that is what I'm going to share with you in the next 30 minutes. And uh, let's get started from the supply side situation. I'll try to be brief and uh, to the point so that you can follow me easily, slide by slide. Let's turn to slide six, please. Migrant workers. The first thing that I want to show you is the situation of migrant workers. So in general, they are going back to work. The left chart is the number of inbound migrants uh, you know, going back to the major manufacturing hubs. So this is the number of inbound migrants uh, going back to the four most economically important provinces in like uh, Guangdong, Jiangsu, Shandong, and Zhejiang, right? And the black line is this year, okay? And the red line is last year. So you can see that from the chart, uh, there is a obvious pickup since late February and stabilizing since then. So this is important because migrant workers in China make up more than one third of the entire working population. So this is this is very important. And the, and the, and the, and the chart on the on the right, that is the number of outbound migrants in Hubei, the 
province of Hubei, which is the epicenter of the outbreak. So you can see from the chart, uh, there is a lot of people have been leaving the province since uh, sometime between the second and the third week of March because the government has relaxed the transport, uh, transportation restrictions. Okay, and the reason that I have this chart included is that uh, Hubei, along with other central provinces like Hunan and Henan and, and Jiangxi, they are very important because they are the most important source of migrant workers in China, account for about 50% of total migrant workers. So it is good to have them back. You know, it is a, it is a sufficient condition for all of the factories to resume production. All right, slide seven. So this slide shows the situation in the manufacturing sector, particularly, uh, and I believe the charts are quite self-explanatory. For instance, the coal consumption by six major power plant on the on the left, the red the red line has been picking up since uh, late February. All right, and same as the coal plant operating rate on the right. Just in case coke is an important industrial product, uh, they are mainly used in iron ore smelting, so it is also a, a very crucial indicator for industrial activities. So both of them are very important uh, indicators of industrial productions, and both of them are become, uh, picking up. That is a good sign, right? Slide eight, please. So this slide shows trading activity. The, the, the left chart shows the iron ore shipments, inbound shipments from the two biggest supplier, Australia and Brazil. You can see that the level already gone back to the uh, level in Q4 last year, right? It's normalizing. And same message uh, from, the, from the right, which is the CNY transaction, right? Also, it is also recovering. So those six charts in the past uh, three slides that I just showed you tell us a general uh, thing, which is the supply side of the Chinese economy is getting back in shape, it's getting better, okay? But what about the demand side? Uh, let's take a look of the demand side. Next slide, please. Slide 10. On the, le on the left, we have home sales. We care about home sales a lot because uh, the property sector can account for about 30% of GDP if we take into account of both the upstream and downstream industry. So you can see that the red line uh, been rising since February and in March, in fact, the sales volume has more than tripled uh, the one that in February, which is good news. And uh, our property analyst has told me that uh, the queues, the lineups already uh, there again, okay? And this is good news. But the thing is, the thing is, the recent development of the retail services. So this chart is uh, movie ticket income because cinema, cinemas are still closed okay so that's why you see that movie ticket income has been zero literally zero all right so uh even many restaurants shopping malls have reopened food traffic is still kind of low below the pre-outbreak level that is for sure uh, for you know very obvious reason people are still afraid of going out so that is the fact so retail services are not back in shape yet far from that okay because the risk of contracting the virus to get infected, you know, is still high, given that given the fact that some people might have already infected but just have no symptoms, right? So people in general are still uh, in uh, in 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 alert mode. So we can reach a little conclusion here. The first one is that there is already a significant improvement on the supply side of the economy, all right? But at the same time, the demand remains very weak, so this is point number one. And point number two is that I would not be expecting there, there is a strong rebound anytime soon, 
Uh, I mean, there will be some stabilization, that is for sure, in the, in the, in the second quarter. But uh, stabilization means stabilization. It doesn't mean a rebound. It doesn't, it doesn't mean a strong rebound, all right? And, uh, and to me, I would say the biggest obstacle right now is external demand. Slide 11, please. Because new cases overseas, like those in the US, like those in Europe are still rising, despite the fact that the pace might have been slowing down in some of the cities, but it is still rising, right? Uh, and the shutdowns in the US and in the uh, European country, uh, uh, cities and countries are cutting off orders to Chinese factories. This is the fact, right? And cutting off orders to Chinese factories exactly when they were beginning to get back on feet. So this is what's happening. And um, we have been communicating with our clients quite uh, you know, frequently in the past two months. So most of them, most of them tell me that their customers have been asking a few things recently. One of them is to delay orders, right? And uh, the other is to, to, to put shipment on hold and ask for payment grace period of up to uh, several months. So this is, this is a story laying out across the country right now. And uh, I expect this to last at least for the next couple of months, all right? Slide 12, please. And against this backdrop, I would say exporters are bearing the brunt. That is for sure. And from provincial level, those at the east side of the country are hardest hit. Because as you can see from the map on slide 12, you can see all of those in the coastal area in the east side of the country, they are still so reliant on, and on export, right? Like Jiangsu, like uh, Jiejiang, like Fujian, Guangdong, even Shanghai, and, and some particular city like Shenzhen and Dongguan, export as a percentage of GDP are still so high. Some of them as high as 80%. Okay, in, on, on average, it's still like something like 50%. All right, so it means a lot to the whole country. Not only the physical production uh, will continue to slow in terms of growth rate, but also the sentiment will, uh, uh, will have an impact on, you know, to the whole country. It, because it is the barometer of the whole country, I mean the, whole, the coastal area. Right? And hurting exports is just the same thing as hurting manufacturers. And in fact, in the first quarter of this year, uh, it is reported that there are 400,000 firms closed for good, closed permanently. And the registration for new firms has dropped by 30% year on year, okay? So that will have implication on the labor market because close to 30% of the labor force right now are being employed by the manufacturing sector. And that will spill over to the other sectors like services. And the reason is very, sir, is very clear to me, right? Because when workers get paid less, uh, they, will, they will spend less and th that will weigh on the prospects for other industries like retailers and hotelers, stuff like that, right? Uh, so put it simply, unemployment rate will rise. Right now it's 6%. I, I, I expect that I will, I, will, I will see seven in the next few, uh, next few months. And that is why I do not agree with some arguments saying that consumption will lead the recovery in the second quarter. No, this is not gonna happen. All right, and in fact, the retail sectors is one of the hardest hit sectors, like restaurants, dining, tourism, and mass transportation, right? And uh, I'm gonna show you a very interesting chart. This is one of my favorites on slide 14. Slide 14, uh, next slide, please. Yeah, this one. So, uh, so this is the traffic data both subway and you know, congestion index. So you can see this is quite bumpy. And the reason of that is during weekdays, people are going back to work. This is, this is for sure, right? But the thing is during weekend, the, week, uh, uh, the traffic during weekend is still very low. 
So that means what? That means are, are, are still not willing to go out during the weekend, uh, weekend because, because, because of the fact that they're still uh, kind of afraid of getting infected, right? So under this backdrop, retailers will get hurt. This is for sure, right? Especially to those non-food products, such as clothing and cosmetics. They are most affected. And these uh, products amount for around 30% of China's retail market. And same thing for, you know, in the, in the food sector, some of them are, are, will also get hurt, like alcoholic beverages, especially those in the meat market and premium range, because, you know, people avoid going to public places like bars and restaurants, right? And even when the pandemic ends, recedes, you know, I would not expect consumption to pick up instantly, like what happened, happened uh, after SARS 17 years ago. No, this is the difference between now and then, right? Uh, because right now, after the, uh, because of the outbreak, people tend to save more. Slide 16, please. Next one. So this is the survey uh, done by some third party. You can say those people that being surveyed, 40% of them saying that they will be saving more of their income, right? And, uh, and, and many people are saying that they will spend money more rational, all right? So uh, I would expect consumption will, you know, the growth of that will stay subdued uh, for quite a while because of the change in cons consumer preferences, all right? And this is exactly why one of the missions for the Chinese government going forward is to boost consumption. Uh, slide 17. I show you uh, one of the ways that the Chinese government right now is, you know, using to boost consumption, which is distributing uh, vouchers. Okay, the one that on this slide is the e-vouchers. Uh, so it will help cushion the impact, definitely. But I don't think it is sufficient to turn the tide. And that is why I believe that the growth driver going forward, at least this year, and early next year will still be government investment. Slide 19, please. Government investment is always important in China. But the thing is, we have to understand from China's government perspective, they do not want a big budget deficit. So they will do something else like issue more special bonds because special bonds are not included in the official budget, right? And in terms of uh, issuance among, I would expect a uh, special bond issuance, issuance will reach something like 3.5 trillion this year compared to 2.15 last year. So that is something like a 60% per, uh, jump in special bond issuance. And all of those money raised from the special bond issuance will be used on infrastructure investment. For your reference, last year, only like 30%, not even 30%, something like 28% of special bond issuance were used for infrastructure last year. 70% of them were used to finance land purchases and slum redevelopment. But this year, this will change. All of the proceeds from special bond issuance will be used on infrastructure. So more money will be spent on energy project and, and sanitation project. No. And in fact, the capital ratio requirement for uh, ports and shipping infrastructure projects have lowered to 20% from 25. Okay, so which means infrastructure funding will receive a boost in the near term because right now those projects can be leveraged more, right? And in terms of monetary policy, next slide, slide 20, uh, PBOC have been using all channels has been has been using all tools to prop up growth, uh, including open market operation like uh, MLF, reverse ripple, cutting interest rate and uh, lower reserve requirement ratio, right? And there's impact, of course. We, we can see that since Chinese New Year, the interbank rates have been uh, hovering at historical low level, which is good. 
right? Because the first thing to do is to maintain financial market uh, uh, stability, right? Stabilizing the, the, the market, okay? So the PBOC has been done, a, uh, has been doing a very good job from this uh, perspective. And then uh, also the credit has been flowing into the real market, like what we can see on uh, slide 21. Credit has been successfully flowing to the real economy. We can see that both M2 and loans and ROK financing, uh, they picked up significantly in March, right? So that, this is encouraging. And, but the thing is, of course, more supportive measures are needed, uh, especially to provide better funding for SMEs because many of them are not benefiting from the loose uh, monetary policy, policy with, uh, uh, because they have limited access to bank loan, right? So they have to do more, uh, you know, from PBOC perspective. Uh, in terms of LPR, we're, we're expecting over the course of the year, there will be 60 basis points cut, and then there will be 300 basis points cut in terms of uh, triple R, so which means one, 150 basis points to go, more to go. All right, next slide, please. And there are implica uh, implications on bond market because uh, you know, the PPOC have been cutting LPR, have been cutting MLF, and all of these rate cuts will keep the, the government bond yield uh, at the very short end of the curve will be very low. But at the very long end of the curve, uh, because of the limited pass-through, the whole curve will remain steep. All right, this is the immediate implication, the goofy curve will remain steep. And because of the steeper and the steeper curve, that will encourage more short tenor issuance, especially there's a wave of maturities in, in the offshore market in the second half. Uh, so it makes sense for the corporates to raise fund onshore because it is way cheaper, right? You can see that the, uh, the chart on the right, uh, the red one is the uh, renminbi average coupon rate, and the uh, great one is the US dollar uh, coupon rate. So there is a, a significant spread between the two, right? And the left and the left chart shows you the steeper uh, goofy curve. You see the red line is the is the difference between three uh, three month and ten year, right? So I think. All of these measures that I just mentioned, including monetary, including fiscal, will be felt gradually. Plus the fact that if the outbreak, uh, hopefully to get contained in, uh, I, let's say in June and July, then we're gonna see a more meaningful rebound in the second half of this year, especially in the fourth quarter. So this is the trajectory that I'm expecting right now, a U-shape, all right, slide 23, please. So if this is the case, then we're expecting the full year growth rate uh, will be something like 2% for China's economy this year, right? And after 2%, there will be uh, something like 5 to 6% rebound next year. Okay, so this is basically our projection right now at the time being. And over the longer term, uh, uh, slide 24, please. One of the long-term implications of the outbreak of the outbreak is that China will invest more on healthcare. Next slide, please. I don't want to go through with you the numbers here because it is so, uh, uh, it is quite uh, self-explanatory. Uh, so the general message is that the Chinese government has been building a lot of infrastructure over the past decade like high, high speed railway and highway, but the fact that they are kind of under invested in healthcare. So going forward, we will expect more investment on the healthcare sector, right? And which means there will be more fundraising in that area. It could, it could be IPO, it could be bond, right? And in fact, we have been, uh, you know, some of our clients are, are doing business in the health sector, right? And they told me that their business have been good recently, and same as those in the uh, uh, pharmaceutical industry, because some of them are selling protection products like 
mask and protective clothing, right? Some of them are uh, in uh, diagnostic products like kits and PCR instruments, some of them in, you know, treating uh, drugs, you know? So they've been doing good. And, uh, you know, this is, this is one of the examples that there is always opportunity, right? And, and of course, there are other uh, examples as well, like those uh, in tech, technology, right? Because online gaming, uh, streaming videos and online education, like the one that you, you, we are using right now, the, the, right now, the platform, right? More and more people are spending time indoors, all right? So this kind of demand are booming, right? And, uh, you know, another sector would be logistics because there's a huge jump in online retail demand. And that's why there's a huge increase in uh, delivery volume. So at the end of the day, uh, I mean, the outbreak also presents some opportunities. All right. So I should stop here. And if you have any questions, we can discuss during the Q&A section. So may I now pass it back to Ken? Sure. Thank you, Nathan. When, when you say that, uh, that there is a lot more demand in healthcare, I can't agree more. It takes a, a pandemic for us to, to understand our health, uh, that our health is so much more important than anything else. Um, yes. But one of the un un unintended consequences of uh, having to stay at home is that we end up eating too much. Then we grow fat. Yeah. But good thing is we we don't we don't get to to show our bellies in front of the video, so that's that's good news. Um, I I see you also brought out uh, digital technology. Um, I think that it's an in, interesting aspect uh, in places like Japan, where uh, physical interaction is uh, held as a revered status among business people. Uh, the attitudes are changing rapidly. Uh, in fact, just last week, uh, the Tokyo governor. Koike uh, Yuriko appealed to businesses uh, to implement telework, which is the, the Japanese term for uh, work from home. Um, so these, uh, these Japanese uh, salary men uh, don't need to come to work anymore, uh, and in, that, it, in which case they can avoid spending hours commuting to, to work on uh, crowded trains uh, to avoid uh, potential COVID infection. So definitely a silver lining in, in this uh, situation is the acceleration of the so-called uh, digital transformation around the world. Okay, uh, next up we have uh, Mark Yang, our economist based in Singapore. Uh, she joined DBS in 2005 and has been specializing in North Asia, including Taiwan, South Korea, and Japan. Uh, she will be discussing the impact of China's supply chain on Asian and global businesses. Okay. Uh, thanks, uh, Ken. So in the next uh, 15 to 20 minutes, we are going to have a look at the supply chain issue. What's the impact of uh, COVID-19 on the region and also on China's uh, supply chain? Uh, next page, please. Okay, so first of all, uh, let's take a look at the Chinese uh, supply chain. What role China plays in the global manufacturing industry? Well, uh, we all know that uh, China is the world's uh, biggest uh, manufacturing factory today. If you look at the uh, chart on this page, uh, there are mainly two product categories that China really dominates uh, global supply. One is uh, low-end manufacturing goods like uh, textile, uh, clothing, and footwear. In this segment, China accounts for as much as uh, 30 to 40 percent of global total exports. And uh, if including the indirect shipments through Hong Kong, the share of China will be even bigger, about uh, 50 percent. And another major product category, China dominates global supply, is uh, machinery and uh, electrical equipment. This includes uh, various types of uh, consumer electronics goods like uh, computers and uh, handphones. In this segment, China also accounts for a significant 20% of uh, global total exports. And adding Hong Kong, the share will be about uh, 30 to 40%. I think a very good example for China's uh, dominant role in the global electronic supply chain uh, was its iPhone. 
will know uh, iPhone is made in China today. In fact, about half of Apple's uh, global production bases are located in mainland China. And for the low-end manufacturing, a very good example is uh, face mask. About half of the world's uh, face masks are made in China. So because of China's uh, production suspension during the COVID-19 period in January and February, uh, many other countries in the world have also been suffering the shortage of uh, mask supply. Next page, please. So uh, in the Asia region, who depends most on the Chinese uh, supply chain? We have two charts on this page. One chart shows uh, the share of China in each Asia economy's uh, intermediate goods exports. Another chart shows uh, the share of China in each Asia economy's uh, intermediate goods imports. So as we can see from these two charts, Taiwan and Korea stand out in terms of uh, the reliance on China for downstream production. As much as 40 50% of Taiwan Korea's uh, intermediate goods exports are sold to the Chinese market. And after Taiwan Korea, Philippines, Malaysia, Thailand, Vietnam also have about 20 30% of their intermediate goods exports uh, going to the Chinese market. And uh, on the other hand, in terms of the reliance on China for upstream raw materials supply, it's uh, Vietnam standing out as much as 30% uh, of the country's uh, intermediate goods imports are sourced from Chinese uh, suppliers. And after Vietnam, uh, Korea, Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, they all have 20% uh, uh, of uh, intermediate goods imports uh, purchased from China. Next slide, please. So because of uh, China's uh, important role in the regional supply chain, after the COVID-19 outbreak in January and February, the production suspension in China also caused uh, some kind of uh, spillover effects into the region. We saw notable impact on the region's uh, automobile industry. As you can see from the first chart on this page, Korea's uh, automobile production fell very sharply, minus 30% uh, young year in February. That was partially due to the shortage of the key auto component uh, imported from China. Partially, of course, also due to the COVID-19 outbreak in, in Korea domestically. And for the electronics industry, so far the impact of China's uh, supply chain disruption has not been very clear. If you look at uh, Korea, Taiwan's uh, electronics production, they have maintained very uh, strong and the positive growth range as of uh, February. I think uh, one reason probably was because uh, um, the automation technology uh, in the uh, electronic sector, and also one reason probably because uh, the demand in the electronic sector has uh, remained uh, resilient uh, for this moment. We will explain it uh, further in the later part of the presentation. Next page. So as discussed during the earlier session, China has started to uh, resume its production since uh, March. And uh, the pace of the supply chain recovery in China has been picking up further in April. So in the region, we also see some kind of uh, relief for the uh, region's uh, manufacturing supply chain. Uh, Korea's uh, automobile production, for example, has already returned to positive and uh, normal growth rate in, in March largely recouping the loss incurred in February. Next slide. Currently, the key challenge in probably is not, it's not about uh, the supply side disruption in China anymore. It's more about the supply side disruption in other parts of the world. Well, um, if we look at the global economy or global manufacturing industry, in fact, uh, there are three major supply chains. One is the uh, US supply chain, second is Germany, and the third one is the uh, Asia supply chain. And the Asia one includes not only China, China but also uh, Japan and Korea. Well, in the US, despite the decline of the, its manufacturing industry, in fact, uh, uh, it remains one of the world's uh, top five exporters of many key manufacturing goods. And this ranges from uh, 
food to chemicals, plastic rubbers, machinery, electrical equipment, and transportation equipment. And very similarly, Germany, in fact, remains uh, the world's um, uh, top exporter of all these uh, key manufacturing goods. And in Asia, in addition to China, we also see that uh, Japan, Korea play a very important part in the global supply of some key manufacturing goods, such as uh, plastic rubbers, uh, metals, electronics, and also motor vehicles. Next page, please. Well, from China's uh, perspective, China, in fact, um, is mostly and highly involved in the Asia supply chain, in the Japan-Korea supply chain. If you look at the tables on this page, in fact, uh, China still relies on Japan-Korea for the supply of some uh, key intermediate goods in the sectors uh, from chemicals to electronics to machinery and transport equipment. And meanwhile, China also highly relies on Taiwan for the um, supply of uh, electronics components like uh, semiconductors. In addition, uh, we also see some linkage between China and the US supply chain, between China and the Germany supply chain, especially for the uh, product categories of uh, machinery and uh, transport equipment. So basically, you can see for the uh, sophisticated manufacturing sectors, China today still needs to import the uh, key parts and components from the uh, advanced economies in the world, including US, uh, Germany, and Japan. So uh, the supply side shock in this uh, Western economies could also have some kind of uh, knock on effects onto uh, China's uh, manufacturing industry. Next page, please. And another major issue we are facing right now uh, is not about the uh, uh, supply chain issue, it's about the demand issue. Global demand is falling because of the uh, COVID-19 outbreak. Well, we have seen a uh, sharp decline of like consumer activities because of uh, the lockdown shutdown measures adopted in major economies from US to Europe and to Asia. Well, uh, according to this uh, Google Mobility Report, which uses uh, location services data, uh, the retail, recreation, and transport activities in many European countries, Southeast Asian countries, and US are currently far below the normal levels at just about 10 to 50 percent. So some of the sectors could be especially vulnerable to the decline in offline consumer activities. Automobile, for example, um, the demand in the sector uh, heavily relies on offline consumer behavior. Well, for, for electronics, uh, the demand uh, stays relatively resilient. Uh, this is uh, partially because uh, electronic sales could be conducted through the online channels. And partially, uh, as we also mentioned earlier, uh, there is a rise of the stay-at-home economy. We are all working from home, study from home nowadays. So actually, there is a higher demand for some electronics products like uh, uh, computers, laptops, and templates. Next page, please. Going forward, as global recession starts to uh, emerge in the next few quarters, uh, as job loss and income declines uh, start to emerge, we are still concerned about uh, the uh, decline in consumer demand for uh, the non-necessity goods, probably on a broad basis. Currently, um, we project uh, all the G3 economies, US, Eurozone, Japan, and the uh, six Asian economies, including Singapore, Hong Kong, Korea, Taiwan, and also Thailand, Malaysia, to fall into recession in 2020. Well, as of um, March, Asia's uh, trade figures have still been doing okay. If you look at uh, uh, Taiwan, Korea, for example, export growth uh, was uh, around 0% uh, in March. And China's exports decline even narrowed in March because of the production resumption from the COVID-19 crisis. Um, but going forward, starting from April and May, we are still concerned about a uh, uh, sharper decline in Asia's uh, exports figures. Well, if you look at the 2008 global financial crisis experience, there is a, a one to two months time lag between the uh, global financial market shock and other event shock. 
entity uh, decline in Asia's uh, actual trade figures. So uh, this time, we will think uh, the turning point probably is around uh, April and May. We may, we may see some kind of uh, further deterioration in Asia's trade figures. And already there are some alarming signs. Uh, South Korea's exports, for example, already reported a 19% decline in their first uh, 10 days of April. And according to the latest data released this week, the decline uh, even widened in the first 20 days of April to minus uh, 27%. Next page. So for asset managers, I think there will be some implication for credit risk. Well, uh, one implication is that uh, in the short term, in the next uh, probably two to three quarters, we are going to see a higher credit risk for the export oriented Chinese companies. Uh, that will be in the export oriented industries like uh, textile and uh, electronics. And uh, meanwhile, the Chinese companies are highly relying on foreign raw materials supply, highly involving in the global supply chain, especially the US, Germany, Japan supply chain, could also face some problems uh, uh, in the short term because of the supply shock in, in other parts of the world. That will be about those uh, uh, sophisticated manufacturing sectors like uh, uh, electronics and automobiles. And uh, in addition, we also want to point out the Chinese companies with uh, weak profitability and uh, high leverage. Even before this uh, pandemic outbreak, uh, as showed uh, by these uh, two tables on this page, that would include China's uh, commodity sector, like uh, petroleum and ferrous metal, as well as uh, automobiles. So to conclude, um, well, in the medium to long term, we will foresee some kind of uh, new opportunities in Asia and in China, uh, probably in, in the later part of 2020 and in 2021. But uh, for the very short term, credit risk uh, for, for some uh, export oriented Chinese companies and also Asian uh, companies probably will rise because of uh, global recession and the income shock resulting from global recession. Okay, so this is already the end of the presentation. Um, I think in the appendix, we will also have uh, the forecast tables for our key uh, indicators like GDP growth, inflation, policy range, and uh, currencies for China and also other major Asian economies uh, for your reference. Uh, I will just stop here and uh, hand over to, to Ken, our moderator. Thank you. Thank you, Kane, for your insights.